for discussion. We'll try to have some time for for a Q&A session. Now let me introduce our speakers. With me today, four wonderful experts with one expert joining in online. Let me begin with Yegor Altman, founder, founder of Altman's Gallery, Russia. Denis, Denis Himeliane, also collector and senior partner of Prime Advice Consulting Group. P.C. Neumann, cultural entrepreneur, film producer and curator for art fairs and private customers. Bogdan Berkovsky, senior expert, International Numismatic Club. And with us online, Inge Reist, Director Emerita, Center for the History of Collecting at the Frick Collection and Frick Art Reference Library. We're talking about collections and collecting today in the most general uh, term. I hope that the speakers will share some things about themselves. This is an interesting topic, but it's hard to access there. People think that uh, uh, the art market is very close and uh, it's not for everyone. Let's try to dispel this myth because we managed to talk about this before the uh, talk began. And without further ado, let me pass the floor to the speakers and uh, let's talk about the art processes that are going on in today's world and what are the prospects of uh, the art market in Russia and abroad. What art, which artists deserve your investments, are worth investing into and uh, what affects the price because if you plan to collect art, or something else. That's what you need to bear in mind. Yegor, let's start with you. I know that you have a presentation ready, so I'm passing the floor to you. Thank you, Svetlana. A couple of words about, uh, words about ourselves and what I'm going to talk about. I specialize on international art for Six years uh, I have been doing this. This November we are going to have an anniversary. We specialize on Chagall, Klimt, Degas, Picasso, Matisse. Mostly first half of the 20th century artists. We also collect contemporary art uh, such as uh, Gerstein and uh, Gloria Jenko and uh, other artists. And um, now a couple of words about geography and what are the Russian prospects on this market. This is what I'm going to talk about. No, it doesn't, it doesn't switch. Now it works. Okay, a couple of figures. There is a preconception that art market is dominated by auction houses, which is not true, as you can see on the diagram. Almost 60% of uh, the deals are done privately by art dealers, and then 42% are auction houses such as Christie's, Sotheby's, Bonham's, Phillips, and others. Where are the, where's the biggest money? And I'm, I'm not talking about the collectors and uh, where items end up, but where transactions happen. The biggest market for transactions in terms of payments is the United States, 44%. Then the UK with 20% of the market, and uh, transactions take place there because the main auction houses and galleries are there. China is on the third place, but this is a local market. 
the Chinese are very national about this. They, they, they buy national art and uh, very rarely can international players buy some things. And uh, China is followed by France, Switzerland, Germany, and other countries. My information is um, until 2019, because in 2020 there, was, there weren't many art fairs and galleries were closed and exhibitions were closed. People couldn't travel. Now many things are being done online. So before that, the international art market was worth around 70 billion US dollars. And what is worth buying? And that's what we've discussed before the talk started. Every second purchase is Picasso, Dali, Schiller, Klimt. So uh, artists like this. And then coming up next, post-war art. Andy Warhol, Roy Lichtenstein, Hockney, Rothko. Third place, 19th century art. Impressionists and post-impressionists, followed by contemporary art, so such artists as Hearst, Murakami, Kusama, and then followed by old masters, who you very well know by the Hermitage exhibitions. And but the, 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 the this share is very small because this market is very, very limited. Everything is in the galleries. So collectors of the 21st century. Until recently, it was believed that collectors are male, older than 40, with uh, degree, uh, academic degree, and uh, with uh, um, high income level. But we, we see that they are being caught up by uh, youngsters, 20 to 35 years old because the, the millionaire market is changing, the billionaire structure is changing. There are many startups and IT ventures and more uh, younger people come with money and uh, they are better, better versed with gadgets. They, they are technologically adept. And uh, the in between are 20% people from 36 to 50 years old. Even though the United States is the largest transaction market, the United States themselves account for only 25% or so. So things that are purchased in the US are then exported somewhere. Germany, 9%. Uh, followed by China and the UK. Where do these people buy works of art? And what are the main players here? I, uh, this list is not exhaustive, but I try to um, mention some of them. Gagosian Gallery, Pace, White Cube, Opera Gallery, these are large network chains spreading from New York to Beirut and Seoul and Paris, but not Moscow, not St. Petersburg, unfortunately. So the current state of affairs, the market slumped in 2020. Out of 70 billion, it shrank to 50 billion in 2020, yet the number of items sold is huge, 31.4 million items, three main regional markets, the US, the UK and China, and with the US being the leader, as I already said, and it's actively 
followed up by China, and the, the gap is getting smaller. And there are many companies that are operating on this market. Almost 3 million people work in 305,000 companies. I'm talking about galleries, transportation companies, um, auction houses, everything. So what's happening in Russia? Russia, as a player, is insignificant. Even though our market is quite large and our economy is quite large, our population again is um, rather significant with well education, a good education, our population is well educated, yet our art market is insignificant. Russians usually buy Russian art and uh, despite the potential it remains largely untapped. Yet there are some art fairs appearing in Russia, there are exhibition projects, people visit exhibitions, they wait in lines, there were quite a few blockbuster exhibitions, so in this regard the market is growing. Now Russia in figures. It is estimated that the Russian market is worth about 10 million US dollars. This is microscopic, microscopically small. But I see that the interest towards the Western art and international art is growing in Russia. And uh, many people begin collecting, begin um, looking into this, and um, many people are really um, aged 30 or younger, under 30 even. So what's, uh, what's going on in the world? The US on the art market is 44%, yet the, the share of the global GDP is 16%. In China, similarly, 18% of the art, art market and 18% of the global GDP. Russia takes 3% of the global GDP and only 0.4% of the global art market. So Russia has a tenfold growth potential in terms of either market players who are undervalued right now because uh, let's have a look at the art of 1960s. The American uh, 1960s arts are very, very expensive, and whereas Russian 1960s art is undervalued, and I believe that this is where the situation will change. And I think, I expect that international galleries will, would come to Russia, and um, we will have uh, auc major auction houses working in Russia. Yegor, I have a question to you straight away as an expert. Why do you think is our ex uh, market so inert? And uh, what's going to happen in the future in terms of pandemic? Did the pandemic lead to increased interest in art or decreased? I have my uh, version of my own. We are we are still in the uh, in the transition in terms of our economics. So it's about consumerism. It still matters what car, car do you drive, uh, which brands do you wear, and which restaurants do you go to. So the Russian elite um, has concepts about uh, glamorous life, um, uh, you know, adopted from James Bond movies and uh, glossy magazines. but. Uh, James Bond movies doesn't tell you what you should uh, need to have in your house because no, no one can, could see what's hanging on the walls of a, uh, of a James Bond apartment. Yes, before the revolution there were interiors and we have uh, photographs, but it all ended in 1917. Um, you could see how rich people uh, rich people's houses look like before the revolution. But what about Chagall? What about uh, the art of uh, the 1960s? You cannot see it anywhere. I mean, on the walls, exhibited. So consumerism leads to us having more Louis Vuitton, 
um, shops in Moscow uh, than in uh, the Georges Pompidou Center in Paris. And if uh, if a major exhibition happens in Paris, it will be discussed by a butcher, a banker, and a grocer, because it's go going to be a major event for for the city. And uh, Western artists are as big celebrities as football players or singers or actors. Uh, sorry for interrupting you, but. Yet, um, we do have, uh, you know, this trend that art is fashionable. So art is, is trending, and uh, people try to, um, to show that they know art. The average check is about 100,000 rubles uh, for, a, for a Russian painting, but no one is thinking about um, deluxe Russian cars or Russian watches. Unfortunately, Russia, in terms of its contribution uh, to the international art, is approximately on the level of uh, cave painting, paintings. It's somewhere between the 1916th and uh, 1924th, and there weren't any uh, breakthroughs. Um, recently and uh, yes indeed the Chinese buy Chinese art and out of 20 top uh, most sold artists in the world five are Chinese but uh, mostly they are international uh, the uh, Italian French uh, but no Russian artists there but there's gonna be a turn because Russian buyers and Russian collectors do not realize that this is the most expensive segment of the lux uh, deluxe de 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 um, industry. You cannot buy a submarine for a uh, 0.5 billion dollars, whereas you can buy a painting that is worth 0.5 billion dollars. And uh, there are rules in the West that I know of and I I, I read about. Uh, Real estate property, for instance, depends on uh, the um, paintings that are displayed there. And I visit sometimes expensive Russian flats, uh, expensive Russian houses, but it may very well have a poster from IKEA on the wall. So we are going through certain stages. We now know which sneakers to wear, which watches to wear, but uh, I think uh, paintings will come next. And now there, are, there is a generation of children come back to Russia who were educated abroad in schools and universities, and they have a different, uh, different worldview. And uh, by abroad, I mean both West and East, Japan, South Korea, Israel, Canada, Europe, and uh, North America. And I believe that these children that inherit uh, the companies of their parents will bring international art with them. And there's a problem problem here. There's a um, the problem is that there are no expensive Russian artists. If I want to buy something really expensive, say $10 million painting, we won't find anything except for the first avant-garde. And it's not Russian art. It cannot be considered Russian because it's international. And that's it. Okay, Kandinsky, you can buy a Kandinsky or Chagall for, for a 10 mil or Lisitsky, but uh, nothing else. You can't buy anything Russian there. And what if your real estate property costs 100 million? What should you put on your walls there? And it takes time. Uh, we'll get there. And that's what we are doing with my colleagues. Um, wonderful. Fortunately, we can compare what happens on the art market and in Europe. 
with Russia. This is why we have uh, a wonderful guest from Germany. So I'd like to pass the microphone to you. Could you please tell us about the tendencies uh, that are in Europe? I know that you come to Russia quite often, and you are a curator of, of uh, art fairs and for private customers. What do people buy and what do they want to buy in Germany? This is very difficult to explain because I um, hold a very special position in this art market. Um, it's even very difficult to describe myself or what I do. So I would say I'm an alchemist writing on my dreams and follow all, followed always my passion in my life. So, and the most important thing is that I uh, try to uh, be in contact with artists who um, uh, have a vision in their life. And this is really difficult. So I'm not a dealer and um, I'm uh, a collector. Also, I would say, um, Many, many gallerists are also collectors, and uh, it's difficult to explain um, um, in, uh, what is um, the way in, in which they, they try to find a new future, especially in, in, in Europe. And because of the uh, pandemi pandemic, it's, um, the, the whole art market changed, even in Germany. So. Um, I, by myself, already um, uh, not. I'm not longer in the analog market. I'm in. I, I stepped in the. I entered the digital market. Uh, especially, I'm now producing NFT works, and. Um, I'm not so in contact with with gallerists and um, but more with artists and um, I have a really a deep connection to auction houses. And if you are in contact with artists, could you tell us what do they feel right now? What is their attitude? And uh, what do they believe will be popular in the future? What people will want to collect, European people? Um, uh, the artists in, uh, with whom I am in contact, uh, they, uh, they focus on digital art, meanwhile. So uh, even um, the, the Russian artist, which I uh, support as a mezzanine, um, they want to produce NFTs or want to tokenize their artworks and looking in which way they can do this, but uh, they are really unsure um, about um, this new digital market because if you, if you go on um, OpenSea or Rarible or Nifty's Gateway, you, you, you will find 100,000 of artworks which are only animated nothings, you know, I would say. Um, the, uh, the covers of Perry Roden in the 70s are more interesting than this uh, technology-based animations. And this is, uh, this is they, also, uh, they also see that uh, there are um, really um, important artists like um, people also, they sold uh, their artworks for millions of dollars, you know. And um, but on the other hand, they know that they have no chance to 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 enter this market because um, this art market is also um, the question of connections and luck, you know. Or you have a curator or a collector who support you and bring you forward. Uh, this is. Thank you. Then let us uh, give uh, the floor to Inge Reist, Director Emerita of the Center of the History of Collecting at the Frick Collection and Frick Art Reference Library. So she is speaking to us from the U.S. And we very much want to know what is the atmosphere there. I know that you, Inge, has been and the art market for a very long time. 
what is your opinion? What is uh, the future? What, what are the trends in the American art market? Days. I think the people are mostly talking about NFTs and questions of authenticity uh, that arise from digital art. Uh, there was a, a fairly recent, uh, almost a prank, that was uh, it, it's kind of indicative of what's going on. A, a, an art collective called Mischief in Brooklyn uh, sold uh, 999 copies of an Andy Warhol drawing that was done in the 1950s. Uh, and within that group of 999, they included the authentic drawing. But nobody, they, say, they claim not even they, know who bought the authentic Warhol. And that means that uh, at, for $250 each, somebody, most people own a fake, but um, that was done robotically, incidentally. Uh, but uh, was one lucky person won't know who he is or what it is, but one person does own the authentic Warhol. So that, I think, is an indication that um, there's a, a kind of turbulence here that is, in a way, upending the, um, the traditions of the importance placed on provenance, for example, because now there is no provenance for that Warhol drawing anymore. It's, it's vanished. So that's interesting. And then I think another thing, uh, interesting observation I read uh, some time ago in the art newspaper was, quote, NFTs are perfectly suited to a collecting culture in which the physical existence of a collectible is viewed as an inconvenience. So that is completely different from, uh, from what we are accustomed to. But um, I hope that uh, my fellow panelists and you, Svetlana, will indulge me for just a few minutes, maybe 10 minutes, because I do contend that even NFTs and even this turbulence and the use of uh, art as a financial instrument is not altogether new. And since my personal background uh, focused always on the history of collecting, uh, I'd like to just show a brief uh, romp through a slideshow of how some of these market trends that we note today do have parallels in the past, which um, I find reassuring <laughs> anyway, but I don't know if, uh, if other people will. So I will uh, I'll begin with a quote. Um, the entire, I'll tell you, in a moment. Okay. Where's uh, my PowerPoint? And let me find the start. Here we go. So the quote is The entire art movement had become an enormous business venture. Only a few persons really care for paintings, the rest buy them from snobbishness or to avoid taxation, presenting pictures to museums and being allowed to keep them until their death a way of having your cake and eating it too. Prices were unheard of. People only buy what is the most expensive, having no faith in anything else. Some buy merely for investment, placing pictures in storage without even seeing them, phoning their gallery every day for the latest quotation as though they were waiting to sell stock, unquote. That being a little bit like the Freeports of today. Well, that quote was, those were the words of the very famous storied collector and innovative gallery impresaria Peggy Guggenheim in 1959 when she was thunderstruck, in her words, upon her return to New York from Venice to witness the sales of the Abex and Colorfield paintings at Castelli's and Andre Emmerich's galleries. So art being used as a financial instrument isn't really new, and even buying it to flip it, as we say today, uh, for a profit is also nothing new, and in fact goes back further than Peggy Guggenheim. Perhaps the first instance of this, and certainly one that is most often cited, occurred in 1798 with the sale of the Italian, French, and Spanish pictures from the famous Palais Royal collection of the Duc d'Orléans. A consortium of British noblemen, sorry, there they are, um, all related to each other, and each bringing to the syndicate something special, whether money, knowledge of art, aristocratic pedigree, 
were guided by the dealer, Michael Bryan, to purchase outright the entire collection of 297 paintings. These were masterpieces by Titian, Sebastiano del Piombo, Raphael, Anibale Caracci, and others. This, the gentlemen then chose the pictures that they personally wanted to keep for themselves, 99 altogether, and they exhibited the rest for sale. This worked out so well that essentially the three members of the syndicate, the Duke of Bridgewater, Lord Gower, and the Earl of Carlisle, got their 99 pictures for absolutely nothing and turned a profit on the rest. A few other points. Leo Castelli famously provided stipends for the artists his gallery represented. Well, and here they are, so many of them on the 25th anniversary of that gallery. But so did the uh, Gonzaga Dukes uh, for Renaissance pa painters such as Andrea Mantegna, who was held on salary at a salary rate higher than most of the rest of the court, and he, uh, yet he was not required to work exclusively for the Duke. Indeed, he was able to take on commissions elsewhere at his own will. And in Baroque Rome, Pietro da Cortona would trade up uh, joining uh, the uh, court of the Sacchetti family from his native Tuscany initially, but then moving over to the much more influential papal family of Maffeo Barberini. And to me, this has its parallel in Jean-Michel Basquiat trading up from Ananina Nosei's gallery to Gagosian, though again, like the Renaissance artists, not necessarily claiming to have exclusive rights. Experiential art has gained traction in the 21st century, Mark Glimcher of Pace Gallery being a prime proponent of that. But again, this seems to also have parallels in the past. Uh, if you look at the happening events that artists like Gian Lorenzo Bernini and Peter Paul Rubens staged, in fact, Rubens dedicated his massive workshop to preparing parade floats for the triumphal entry of Cardinal Infante Ferdinand in 1634. And on at least one occasion, Bernini flooded the entire Belvedere courtyard of the Vatican Palace to stage a sea battle, or Naumachia, much as uh, was staged in the courtyard of the Pitti Palace by the Medici for the wedding of Marie de Medici in uh, 1597. So, and I find the parallel to this very much in the work of David Hockney for opera sets and even for Christo. These are also experiential art that, um, that is here today and gone tomorrow. Another instance of that from the past being Gian Bologna, the brilliant court sculptor of the Medici in 16th century Florence, who regularly produced sculpture made of ice or sugar, ephemeral and intended for his audience to enjoy just in that moment. And in my view, that is not so unlike Banksy's picture, self-destructing through a shredder, now twice having made headlines during the last couple of years. A fixation on buying contemporary art, especially uh, among nouveau riche collectors, and the appeal of meeting the artist is much written about these days. But certainly during Gilded Age America, this was exactly what happened too. Department store magnates and spectacularly rich industrialists started collecting contemporary art, which was very hot in the market of that day. And who recognizes many of these names anymore? Uh, but these were the most sought after artists when these uh, wealthy entrepreneurs and bankers initially started collecting. Yet yeah, this was William Walters. You see his gallery full of works by artists like Jerome and Millet. William Henry Vanderbilt's gallery, which he opened for the public to see, consisted almost exclusively of contemporary art. And even Henry Clay Frick, began his collection with uh, contemporary art such as these that were hung in his Pittsburgh home. Now, of course, all of these collectors went on to collect extraordinary medieval Renaissance and early 19th century art, but their beginnings lay in the contemporary field. 
Peer pressure was, of course, a factor. I'll have what he's having because they stayed abreast of what was going on among their rivals. And like uh, today's collectors, they loved visiting artist studios. And this was often arranged by very savvy agents such as Samuel Avery. Collectors of the Gilded Age also frequented the salons of uh, France uh, in Paris and in London, but that even goes back further to the Renaissance, as you can see in this Canaletto painting, I show a detail up above, with an open air art fair in Venice, something that occurred with some regularity. And here you see the Paris Salon of 1785 and Thomas Rowlandson's uh, rendering of the Royal Academy exhibition in 1808. And to my mind, this, of course, has exact parallels in the art fairs of today, especially Art Basel in Switzerland, Miami, and Hong Kong. Which brings me to the role of the dealer, ever on the mind of the collector. Agents have always loomed large, and throughout the centuries, that tension between serving the artists that one represents, especially if you represent living talent, as Castelli did, and representing your client, here's Gagosian, Castelli, and Charles Saatchi, uh, was always there. But promotional strategies have really not changed all that much. For example, uh, Jean-Baptiste Pierre Lebrun uh, wrote a huge two-volume catalog of, of uh, German, French, uh, German, Flemish, and uh, Dutch paintings in order to create a market that didn't exist in Paris at the time, but which he could profit from. And Adolf Goupil sold quantities of reproductive prints to whet the appetite of new collectors such that eventually they would buy the paintings that the prints were made after. Durand Ruel published a magazine featuring the avant-garde impressionist artists he represented, and he well understood the advantage of exhibiting their work internationally at galleries he established in Paris, Vienna, London, and New York. And that, of course, is exactly, sorry, what Gagosian has done, publishing the Gagosian Quarterly and maintaining multiple exhibition spaces worldwide. Paul Rosenberg, the famed Parisian dealer who later moved to New York after the war, staged monthly one artist shows for Matisse, Picasso, Sisley, Brock, Marie Laurence, while others like Castelli uh, burnished his gallery's image so that the art uh, and that of his artists with splashy spreads in Playboy that presented the art collector as the epitome of the cool madman kind of executive of mid-century uh, modern. Finding up and coming new talent has traditionally not been because of wealth, but rather because of passion and dedication. And Svetlana referred to this a little bit earlier. Who are the people who spot the talent and does it take money or is it something else? Herb and Dorothy Vogel, the postman and the librarian are the beloved poster children of this. But millionaires who began uh, collecting at a young age are not always that very different. Uh, Eli and Edith Broad used to prowl the uh, downtown galleries long before their enormous wealth enabled them to acquire more or less whatever they wanted. Eli Broad always delighted in recounting his own bad judgment in not purchasing a Warhol Campbell soup picture that had interested his wife, only to spend millions on another version of it decades later to make up for his earlier missed opportunity. And lastly, N NFTs strike me as just the next iteration now of a, now in a digital environment, of course, of the certificates that the conceptual artists like Saul LeWitt and Felice Gonzalez Torres provided to collectors such as Agnes Dund and Rosa de la Cruz. So even though technology might be superficially a tremendous game changer, and I just heard on the news this morning that people regard NFTs too big to fail now, partly because of the seeming success of uh, cryptocurrencies too, I do think that the one thing that prompts today's collectors to chart new territory is the globalization of the markets and the instantaneity of every transaction and of every action. And I wonder 
what everybody makes of this. This was in last Saturday's New York Times, an advertisement for Tiffany featuring a Basquiat called About Love. So this is uh, anybody's guess what, uh, what is on the mind, but it certainly is eye-catching and got my attention. So I look forward very much to talking about today's trends with Svetlana and my fellow panelists, but hopefully this was helpful to you to get some historical context. Thank you, Inga, for this wonderful, bright overview into the history of collecting. Let me ask a question from one of uh, the members of our audience who wants to know how great is the interest of the American youth towards art and collecting? I think it's definitely there, but, um, but it, they're very adventurous, I think, at the moment. So they're, uh, as they are um, more apt to step into the world of cryptocurrencies, they're more apt to step into uh, the, the superficially more risk-taking areas of, uh, of digital acquisitions. I, uh, I was reading the other day that nowadays a lot of the videos that go viral on TikTok are being sold as NFTs, for example. And I think that it is young people who are who are buying those. And of course, the Silicon Valley wealth and the comparatively younger age of the millionaires and young billionaires uh, is undoubtedly a factor in that, too. Thank you very much. Please uh, stay with us. We still have um, a lot of interesting topics to cover. And one of such topics is uh, the one Denise is going to share with us. And he is going to talk about how to become a collector. So I, if I want to become a collector, should I, should I do, what should I do? How should I begin? Should I go and get a university degree in art? Or should I find someone who has been in this business for many years? Can you give us a practical advice? Hello, my name is Denise Himilaini. I'm a collector. Before starting to collect, you need to, get, to have money. Unfortunately, in our today's market, if you have no money, the only thing you can collect is uh, matchboxes or maybe bugs or butterflies. But after you uh, understand that you, you are ready to lose money on buying art, only then can you gradually become a collector. Because a collector is a person who sometimes loses money and he is okay with that. In Russia there are quite a few uh, rich people and they do many things but very few of them are collecting art if I do have money what should I do I wanted to say a few words about Russian art first and uh, about contemporary Russian art in particular the art market uh, is a copy of uh, just a market in general uh, of the economy and I think Russia is at the end of the list of developed countries at the bottom and we also have a very big division between rich people and poor people very few rich people and the majority just lives paycheck to paycheck and gets about 50,000 rubles per month. So it's uh, the same on the art market as with the vaccines right now. Um, as many people as possible should be like, sick with art. They should be uh, seeking it, they need it. But what can you do if your, your salary is very low? You can't afford it. And uh, as, as long as the situation is this way, no art market will be here. Uh, the, the countries that you mentioned in the previous report, uh, all those countries are wealthy, with a good economy, with a very effective tax system, with a low level of corruption. Only when we are like that, 
our country is like this, then we'll have a Rus Russian art market. And Russians will buy both foreign and Russian art. I, I think I, I cannot disagree with you, and I believe our experts will also agree. But still, there is one point that is still important. I think that if you have a wish to collect and you have the ability to, con to collect, you still lack information on how to begin and how to, to educate yourself and to foster this love and interest to art and where to find the necessary knowledge. First of all, you need to separate collecting from investment. You need to answer to yourself, who are you? Are you a collector or are you an investor? You buy art as an investment or you buy it because you're interested in it. In Russia, if you buy Russian art, this can only be because you love it. If you buy it as an investment and later sell, then you need to be an expert. And uh, you cannot outsmart the market. And before you make money, you will lose a lot of money. So uh, it's not profitable to invest in Russian art. No, I didn't say that. I said that on the way towards making money, you will incur a lot of losses. You will buy fake art. You will buy overpriced art. You will buy insignificant artists. You, you will buy like, a bad painting from a good artist, from a bad period. So you will make a lot of mistakes before you learn how to invest. Are there many such risky collectors in Russia? Okay, let us distinguish. There are collectors and there are investors. Those are different people. I am a collector. So you collect Russian art, yes. So can you tell us whom you collect? What are the pr proud jewels of your collection? I, I will not just say just one. I, I, I'm, I have thousands of, picture, of paintings in my collections and I don't want to name any names. Okay. I think in any sphere there is a community. Uh, they support you, your drive uh, towards your, your hobby, your love. And at the same time, it gives you an understanding of what everyone around you does. And uh, is this community active in Russia? Is it developed? There is, a, there is very few money. Uh, 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 in, uh, in the Russian market, and half, I think half of uh, all the valuable Russian art is Rodko. So everyone knows everybody. Those who buy a lot, they all know each other, and there are more good artists than collectors. So there is no um, competition there to sell your art. I wanted to add a few things. I wanted to, to develop Denise's thought. Russian market is about 200 million dollars. $200 million. And uh, the market grows. In Moscow, there is a huge deficit of uh, Russian classic art. Uh, and uh, for instance, uh, I know a dealer who said, uh, if anyone would buy, uh, would bring me a pen, pay, painting by Russian uh, Peredvizhniki, the Wanderers, I would buy, I would sell it in an hour. So the demand is there. But no one knows precisely the value of uh, the Russian art market, just because many paintings are bought for cash. And I think uh, in Europe or in Israel, it's practically impossible to buy for cash. So the statistics are quite, uh, quite real. But uh, in Russia, it's not so. It is, uh, it's never clear who sold which painting and for how much. And as for investment, it is also an important issue. I am convinced that if a person wants to collect good things, nothing prevents them from buying paintings 
that will never be uh, reproduced. For instance, each year uh, there are sales of Picasso's paintings for like, $600 million. And uh, if uh, so, it's about 600 million, more or less. I even made a list of top 10 best sellers, best selling artists for the past 10 years. And Picasso is always in this top 10. But if you, for instance, pick uh, one period of his uh, work, and uh, it is very unlikely that you will buy a fake painting. But uh, the Russian, on the Russian market, there are many fakes. I can tell a lot about it. I think it is a separate and very interesting issue. And I wanted to ask you, Denis, uh, you, because you are a collector, how secure do you feel? as a collector, are there any guarantees? And uh, how does the state regulate the selling and buying of paintings? Are there experts whom collectors trust? Because I think it is a very big issue for all the collectors. First, let me comment on what Yegor just said about buying Picasso, about Russians buying Picasso. Many people ask, why does Russian art, why, why is Russian art so cheap compared to Western art? As long as Russians don't buy Russian art, nobody in the West is going to need it. Because Western collectors move towards the places where money is. And if there is no money in Russian art, there are no takers. So I advocate for buying Russian art. Uh, the second issue is on fakes. There are experts on the leading artists. Uh, so th those are experts who are recognized by the community. They've published books. Uh, so you can just look at uh, which books a person published and whether you can trust him or her. And you can just approach them through. Uh, and if it is a contemporary artist, you can just uh, contact them directly like through Facebook and ask, is this your painting? And uh, this way you will make sure that uh, it is not a fake. This is why I also advocate for buying contemporary art or from people who are still alive. You can ask them if it is a fake or not a fake. I also wanted to add a few things. It is my opinion, I don't have the figures to support it, but many say that the Russian market is the one where most fakes are. So it's very dangerous to buy in the Russian market. But uh, there were such scandals uh, abroad as well. When there was uh, an exhibition in Belgium of Russian painters, there were some fakes there, and it was a huge scandal, and it does no favors to Russia, to the Russian image. My stepfather is uh, one of the prominent artists of the 1960s. His name is Igor Vuloch. Uh, his paintings are in the Tretikov Gallery in the Russian Museum, and uh, there are some paintings in Denmark, in Greece, in many private collections, both in Europe and in the US. And uh, I was once in a gallery, and I see a painting that was signed by, by him, by my, by my stepfather. And I tell the gallery owner, this is a fake. I am positive. I am sure. But he did nothing. Uh, the painting wasn't removed. And the painting has a certificate of authenticity. And, uh, I know that uh, abroad there were cases when experts gave certificates of authenticity to dubious paintings. But uh, the problem of the Soviet Union and the lack of the market there, because most of the painters whom we are discussing today, those are from the, those times. And uh, uh, when we speak about Matisse, Chagall, Picasso, there are catalogs of their works. For instance, I have uh, a Fernand Leger painting in my collection. It used to be in the collection of the artist uh, himself. Then it belonged to the museum. Then, for one reason, uh, the museum decided to sell it. Uh, 
It was sold to a private collector, and then it, it was bought by Gianni Versace, and uh, then I bought it. It is very hard to fake a painting when it went such a long way. Uh, so it has a sticker of authenticity on the back, uh, the back of the painting. The museum is still open. It can verify it. So all the collectors are still alive. They can, ver can verify this route. So, you know, but not every painting can be traced like that. And these are the, the issues of the Russian paintings. So you can trace it. You can't trace the provenance of all paintings. And uh, paintings, for instance, by Danish or German uh, painters, Dutch painters, uh, of the same from the same period, of the same quality, also on canvas with the same uh, materials. Uh, Uh, they are more exp expensive than Russian artists. And uh, so a painting wor that is, uh, it will be wor worth 10 to 30 times more than the Russian painting of the same period. In the Soviet Union, there was a textbook called uh, Our Speech, so Russian Speech. And Russian collectors learned about art from that book. And the most popular and the most expensive uh, paintings are those that were reproduced in this uh, book. It's, uh, essentially, it's an ABC book. It's for very small children. And uh, these works are not in international museums. There are Picasso, Kandinsky, Chagall, Rotko, uh, but no, none of the painters from this book. And they are quite expensive. Is it because they recognize those paintings? It is because people buy it just to show off. They don't care which painting it is. If everyone knows that it's expensive, they'll buy it. Uh, and I think what will have potential and where there is a potential for growth and where you can trace the provenance. Because there are, of course, the alive painters, but still, even if the artist is, de is dead, there are his families. But I think the six tiers so, are the ones so, whose provenance you can trace. And uh, their paintings worth like 10, 20, 30 thousand rubles. But uh, they are good. Any museum would be happy to have these paintings. And I believe that this period, the works from this period will, will be popular. I'm friends with Andrei Movchan, an economist, and he says that you need to buy things that can no longer be made again. So you cannot buy painters, uh, paintings made by the artists from the 1960s, like Vulog, Krasnopertsov, and Kabakov, for instance. So paintings that were made in the Soviet Union until 1980s, for instance. And they are very cheap. They're dirt cheap, in my opinion, right now. And uh, there were some paintings uh, sold through Sotheby's, Christie's, McDougal's. And uh, so they are very cheap. But some se secondary artists, so second-rate artists, are sold at, uh, for more money. Uh, we're talking about pictures mostly right now. So uh, Bogdan here is a numismatics expert. So he is a coin expert. Um, completely different area. And coin collection, forgive my layman's view, uh, coin collecting is something to me is very local, something that our grandfathers or maybe fathers used to collect. When you open a, an album, you see the, all those different coins, and you don't really understand their value. Um, so is it worth investing into? Um, we know that these coins used to be in circulation, but that's it. What is happening on this market? Is it worth investing into. Thank you, Svetlana. You are quite right that we've been discussing uh, the high 
art or the fine art and uh, you mentioned the, the capitalization of this market that is absolutely fantastic yet we understand that this is not a popular market this is not for everyone and uh, there are only a few who can collect art so there are two worlds the world of pictorial art and uh, the world of collectibles things to that can be collected and there are different worlds in numismatics it all began in renaissance when people were interested in everything antique if you could uh, dig something out you could sell it and uh, you know very well the Medici collections and uh, the papal collections and uh, collections of other wealthy people that grew very rapidly back then in the Renaissance period and coins were um, Uh, rather widespread and uh, I mean ancient coins and the coins were the proof that those ancient cultures existed by the way uh, there were uh, dates uh, and names and portraits on those coins and for instance a legendary Trojan Emperor you could see his face on, on a coin so they serve as a proof that uh, our culture is uh, old and um, that uh, uh, by the way and coins are used to disprove the um, falsification theories and because sometimes people say that um, it didn't happen oh, th that historical event didn't happen coins can disprove that and this is where kunst cameras um, when uh, when kunst cameras appeared the cameras of wonders the chambers of wonders and chambers of art and we as collectors um, coin collectors deal with uh, the uh, items that are not unique by definition or more or less mass produced items or uh, to draw a parallel with the, the um, with the art, it's a mass-produced art. Etchings, uh, etchings were a, a a way to reproduce art, and to see the genuine Raphael, you had to go to Rome or somewhere else, and uh, otherwise you could only see an etching. So there's a certain duality. There's Raphael. And there's a etcher who made an etching of a Raphael. So collections are us usually con consist of mass-produced items. And even in ancient Greece, coins were printed in the hundreds of thousands. And uh, the that makes coins accessible and uh, coin collecting accessible to many people paintings can cost millions of do dollars and uh, some of the speakers I think said that the uh, that you can buy a uh, an average work of art in Russia for a hundred thousand but you can still buy a, an, of rubles. You can still buy a, an ancient uh, Greek coin that is two thousand years old for a hundred rubles. So thousand times cheaper than a painting, and that's that's uh, again coins prove that that culture existed. And a collector is a person who who knows something about the items he or she collects. You mentioned matchboxes. Fine, but a matchbox in a collector's hands 
is not just a matchbox. This is a conceptualized, concentrated knowledge about this matchbox. Because matchboxes um, were often designed by famous artists. By the way, in, in Soviet times, in the 1920s and 30s, avant-garde artists used to design matchboxes. In uh, Later, in, 19, in the 1960s, matchboxes showed the technical advancement and scientific advancements. So collecting is about knowing what you collect. And if you can't really tell why you need this, why you collect this, you cannot impart this knowledge to someone else. I'm sorry for interrupting you, Bogdan. Could you tell us more about trends in numismatics? Because it's more or less clear with uh, fine arts, there are decades, um, there are trends, uh, periods that are more popular or less popular. But what is hot in numismatics? Because you take part in international exhibitions, you probably know what's going on in numismatics. Again, since coins are mass produced, there are there are such um, trends like on the stock markets. Some some trends are going up, some trends are going down. Some things are getting more expensive, some things are getting less expensive. Probably it's the same with uh, the fine arts market. In terms of demand, prices, and uh, importantly, liquidity, antique coins are number one. Why? Because the cradle of the European civilization is there, and by European I mean the United States here as well. Uh, the cradle of uh, our civilization is ancient Rome and ancient Greece. And the number of collectors who are interested in ancient Roman and Greece coins is the highest in the world. And that makes this market the most powerful, as it were. As for the rest, it's the same ratio as with GDP uh, breakdown. The most expensive, uh, the biggest markets, uh, the, uh, coins rather, are American coins. Because America, again, it corresponds to the GDP share. America is interested in American coins. That's as simple as that. Russia is interested in Russian coins. Germany, German coins. One exception is China. China is interested in European coins and thalers. Thalers are large and shiny and uh, undervalued very often. Uh, they used to be the most available European co coins uh, until recently. As for the Russian numismatics, Russian, uh, Russian Empire is the hottest segment. I can't say that this is the most diverse segment or the most interesting one even, because the most diverse and interesting coins uh, date back from the medieval times. But the coins of that time are small and not shiny, and it's hard to read what's written there. So uh, what a beginning beginner coin collector wants to do is to collect a lineup of uh, coins of the same period. And it's also hard to do with medieval coins. They are varied and diverse. Anyone can start collecting coins. And uh, it's especially relevant for Russia with its social uh, stratification and seg segmentation. And then you can deepen your uh, knowledge in a certain segment and uh, your specialization. Because it's about investing into yourself, like self-investments. And then if you have enough money and uh, enough 
interest, you can look for more expensive segments. So coins and uh, post stamps, this is something that most collectors started with. And uh, now they have galleries, some of them, and uh, Chagall paintings. They all began small, because that's, that's something that is part of our human culture, and we are, we are collecting human culture. Thank you, Bogdan. I have a general question, and I'd like each of you to say some things about it. Talking about collecting, what is the main demand these days, and what is the main motivation of collectors these days? What, what drives them, and what do they want? Why do they do this? What's their reasoning? Is it fashionable? Is it trending? They have some money to spare? Or because I'm looking at Europe and see that there are many people in Europe who are building their own collections, and I want to do the same, and it, it increases their personal rating. What drives collectors? I think that you are overestimating the f figure of a collector, someone who is extremely rich and uh, who is looking up to, to other people and who makes their own decisions. Many of my friends are quite wealthy and uh, they have money and they, they like art. And that's why they collect art, because they can, they can do so. They can afford it. That's it. As simple as that. But, okay, talking about wealthy people and what they do in lives, in, uh, in their lives, apart from uh, business and professional interests, um, these wealthy people invest into different things. And uh, I think that collecting is about investing into yourselves. All today's experts said that collecting is about development, personal development, above all, is about interests that people share all across the world, in Europe, in the United States, in Russia. So you, you find yourself in a community of like-minded people who are interested in the same things. So when people try, uh, try starting collecting things, be it matchboxes or coins or whatever, you need to understand why you do this. And that's what I'm trying to to find out. Something um, uh, about um, starting a collection. So um, I think the the main thing is that you uh, is the interest in which um, or the the uh, for example, if you are interesting in photography, you are concentrating in photography. So this is the way. Like I start. I always like photography. And when I bought my first Diane Arbus um, a photo in, in 1982, there was not existing a photography market, even not at auction, and even I didn't know any collector who, who collect uh, uh, photography. To, and nobody can't expect in, at this time that uh, such, a photogra uh, such a photograph like this uh, would, would um, have uh, an auction result uh, of, of over $400,000 now, you know? And um, I was often asked um, how to, to, to start collecting, and I, I think um, it has nothing to do whether you are rich or, uh, or not rich, you know, whether you have money or not. Um, because um, you, the, mo the main thing, if you, if you go to a museum and if you like Picasso, and you are standing in front of a Picasso even for 15 minutes, then you became such an owner of this picture, of this painting, you know? And that means that also in your mind, in your brain, is existing a, in a, 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 is existing a collection, you know? It's not physically, 
but it's, you, you like it, you, you, you can use it, you, you never will forget this kind of painting, this Picasso or whatever you saw in, 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 uh, in, in the museum. And this is the most, uh, this is a, a most attractive quality of a human who, who like to collect things, you know. Even when you, when you, uh, uh, when you uh, uh, since I was born, I collect pictures, uh, whatever, yeah, and uh, sounds, music, you know. I have a really uh, not physical existing collection in my own brain, and this um, is like a motor of your passion, you know. And then you can select whatever you you see in your uh, in the, in the world you can select maybe you 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 have, you, have fi you find a coin yeah and this is a cool cool example yeah and you only uh, spend 50 ruble to 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 uh, to buy it but this coin becomes now really an important uh, part of your life yeah and all the things which I bought, I bought with passion, and I call, I call all my paintings and things which I collect my own children, you know? And when I, I bought, after I bought it, I invited my family, I organized a dinner, and I say, welcome to my paintings, yeah? And welcome to my art, and it doesn't matter whether, whether it's a coin or a matchbox car or whatever. And this I call passion, and this is the motor in general for a collector. Но на самом деле PC это то, что спасибо большое. Thank you very much. This is what I wanted to hear. So collecting is passion, regardless of what you collect. Yes, please, please. Да. I couldn't agree 100 percent with uh, with that and the passion that people like Herb and Dorothy showed. That is to me the mark of a of a real collector who who feels it to the core. It is, however, often observed that some people collect because they are buying into a particular kind of lifestyle. This has been written about recently about uh, some of the collectors, young collectors in Asia, that they are buying into a Western lifestyle. And certainly in the Gilded Age, American collectors, some of them anyway, were driven as much by uh, by that desire to come across as aristocratic and people with a, a strong lineage, even if they were nouveau riche. I don't think those are always the genuine collectors. I think it is really the passion that should be uh, should be noted. But uh, and and I think having a I love the idea of a collection in your head, but the motivations can vary. And I should add that there are a lot of wealthy people who don't collect art at all. So it's not just a function of money, and that's where the passion comes in. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from the audience? We now have some time. If anyone has a question to our distinguished guests, please do so. Um, could I ask a question, Svetlana? It's um, I, I think in in China when the the contemporary market for Chinese art was beginning to grow in the I think late 70s and certainly in the 80s, there weren't any dealers apparently. So collectors like the Swiss collector Uli Sig had to go to the artist studios, and there there was a whole art scene, but it was kind of underground. And I'm wondering if uh, there are similar situations in Russia with uh, people going directly to the artists and going and buying from the artists directly without the middleman involved. Um, is there that kind of a contemporary art scene in Russia? Yes, and. And uh, I, I will answer your question, but please first answer mine. What is the painting behind you, and what do you collect? I first 
husband was an artist and this is a painting that he did. So uh, that's very simple. And for the years that we were married, I basically collected his art because that's what was on our walls. Um, now I, um, my, my current husband uh, loves marine art and so do I. So we have quite a bit of marine art, but, um, but I really um, feel so spoiled that here to to the last um, point, um, a lot of what I collect is in my head because I live in New York and I have the wonderful advantage of going to the museums regularly. I'm right across the street from the Metropolitan Museum. So in a way, my collection is their collections much more than my personal collection. A wonderful answer, thank you. But let me answer your question. I think that collecting is a type of neurosis, just like Freud said. So everyone just resolves their childhood issues. And uh, collecting is just one of the life scenarios. But uh, there is nothing to be done about it. And, uh, I think uh, artists and wealthy people have have uh, very similar mental problems. Just I read a book called uh, Leonardo's Childhood recently. And, uh, uh, for instance, Schiller's paintings are very expensive, and uh, his subjects are often a bit disturbing. Currently, Chile is sold for like 600 to 800 thousand, and Klimt, who was older, is sold cheaper. But Chile was treated for his addiction to pornography. And Chile just died, died very young. So I think uh, just some people have a propensity uh, to certain types of art due to their mental issues. So you believe this is uh, what then his work is going to be more expensive? I think that uh, if an artist's life story is invigorating, is very unusual, then it will be remembered. For instance, not everyone knows Van Gogh's paintings, but everyone remembers that, that he cut off his own ear. And uh, I think in Russia, in China, and in other countries as well. So this story is famous. And now let me answer your question about the markets. China and Russia are very different. And China is lucky because uh, in top 20 best-selling artists, uh, five of, the, of them are Chinese. So they're not always uh, uh, represented in other countries, but I know that the Metropolitan Museum is, supports the na national heritage. But and, uh, I think uh, what happened in China, and in, in, uh, it was very severe in terms of this, those repressions, but the Soviet repressions were even bloodier than the Cultural Revolution in China and, uh, during the Mao Zedong times. And we uh, so the Chinese are very monolith. They are not divided. And, uh, yeah. Back in uh, between 1918 and 1930, um, around 5 million Russian citizens emigrated. But uh, initially, there were Russian shops in Europe and um, things like that, but then they assimilated. Uh, several generators, generations later, and there were no Russian diaspora anymore. Uh, they were, they, they nationalized. But uh, China is a different story, because China, China, the Chinese do not nationalize, do not assimilate, rather, and they, they still live in their diasporas. And um, it's the same with, with, with art. That's what's going to happen in the future. And uh, Russia will be buying art more, including local art. And the 60s are most promising in this area. Now a couple of words about China. And are they real collectors or not? Or are we running out of time? We have five, five minutes left. 
And there's another thing I'd like to bring up because uh, I believe it's going to be interesting to you all. Recently in Russia, private galleries begin to appear. So there is another trend in Russia, it seems, uh, to open a private gallery. So it seems like everyone is interested in art, or at least pretend to be interested. When I visited Copenhagen for the first time, that's what I noticed, how natural these little galleries look in Copenhagen in, in the ground floors of uh, the houses because it's not like this in Russia. These galleries feel artificial, as it were. So what is this trend? Is it uh, a sign of times or is it a tool for collectors? Well, because, you know, in Soviet times there were no art galleries. Um, uh, and it, it's just the uh, scale. From zero it became, uh, it, it got to a certain number. I, I, I believe that Geneva, for instance, has more galleries than entire Russia does. So it's just because there were no galleries at all before that in, in Russia. I know a couple of galleries in Voronezh, Yekaterinburg, um, but that's it. Most of them are only in, in Russia, in, in Moscow, in St. Petersburg. What about online galleries then? What is being sold there and is it trustworthy? A couple of words about private museums. Everyone is addressing the same pro problem, but uh, uh, people have different amounts of money. They all want to live forever, so that is why someone is buying vitamins and someone is buying paintings. And people with lots of money uh, try to leave their mark in history, because Shukin um, would be forgotten in Soviet times as an entrepreneur, as an industrialist, had he not collected his art collection. So he's known for that, not for his entrepreneurship. And uh, Russia is the country that suffered most in the 20th century. There are no other countries that suffered such terrible human losses in the 20th century. And, and indeed, there are several private museums in Moscow now, but um, there number is neglect to yourself. I've been waiting for this question because, well, it may, might tell something about myself, uh, but I don't collect anything. I've uh, never collected anything, and I never wanted to collect anything. It's just uh, my psychic specificity. Well, let's, let's finish on that, on my psychic disorders. Um, because I, I never wanted to collect anything ever. Thank you all for your valuable inputs. Thank you for this interesting discussion. Russia and Germany, the United States, joining us live as part of Culture 2.0. Thank you for that. Uh, in 30 minutes, we are going to have another discussion about culture. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.
Театр уже давно привлекает зрителей не только в залы, но и к экранам смартфонов и планшетов. Но пандемия стала дополнительным толчком к переходу на новые форматы взаимодействия. Так, Брянский театр драмы реализует проект «Театр в 360 градусов. Новый взгляд». И одной из самых ярких постановок стала последняя лента Крэпа по пьесе Бекета. Весь спектакль сняли на камеру с углом обзора 360 градусов, что создает эффект полного погружения. Российско-финляндский спектакль по пьесе Ипсона Пергюнд «Три новеллы» планировался к показу на приграничных территориях России и Финляндии. Но в новых условиях планы пришлось изменить. Команда проекта из Петрозаводска совместно с режиссером Кириллом Збитневым и финскими коллегами решила создать видеоверсию постановки. Оперный спектакль и Let's Play. Такое новаторское сочетание рождает совершенно новый жанр – Let's Play опера. Премьера «Скупого рыцаря» состоялась онлайн в августе 2020 -го. И с тех пор опера набрала больше 130 тысяч просмотров. Александринский театр представил новую программу «Другая сцена». Оригинальные онлайн-форматы от молодых режиссеров, хореографов, композиторов и медиахудожников. Трансляции проекта можно увидеть в группах театра в социальных сетях. В условиях вынужденной разлуки со зрителем и друг другом артисты Пермского театра у моста решили показать, как проходят их репетиции по скайпу. Получился скрин-лайф-сериал о творческом процессе под названием «Короноизоляция». Анимацию, театр и виртуальную реальность объединил в себе проект «Алиса в стране чудес» московской студии «Элиговижн». Актриса в макап-костюме на виртуальной сцене демонстрирует совершенно новый взгляд на сказку Льюиса Кэрролла. У нас есть технология, и, соответственно, эти технологии будут каким-то образом интегрироваться в театральную жизнь, в художественную жизнь, в создание скульптур, произведений, искусства и все-все-все, что связано с культурой. Но один из первых шагов – это действительно интегрировать это в театральную, в театральные подмостки. Потому что сам театр – это уже почти виртуальный ряд, потому что актер имеет возможность импровизировать на сцене. А мы даем возможность еще совместить это с виртуальными образами, и эта импровизация она будет еще более серьезной. То есть с нашей точки зрения это все-таки художественное произведение, которое использует элементы технологий, которые мы можем предложить сейчас. Ну и одна из задач была сказать, что это есть. Ребята, давайте пользоваться вот этими технологиями и не бояться их. Попробуем создать нечто интересное не только для, с точки зрения технологий, но с точки зрения и произведения искусства, то есть самого театрального спектакля. Это еще одно измерение, которое позволяет создать произведение нового типа, реально нового типа. И если убрать, например, эту виртуальную составляющую, это будет спектакль. Если ее добавить, получается некое новое произведение, которое более технологичное и более интересно, может быть, для молодого поколения, которое уже привыкло к тому, что эти вот технологии, они везде. Творческое осмысление опыта самоизоляции во время пандемии воплотилось в спектакле театра «Балет Москва». Шестеро артистов изучают уголки своей квартиры через танец. При этом жилище становится сценой, а гаджеты – полноценными участниками постановки. Сценическое искусство вне театральных сцен. Краснодарское объединение «Премьера» также показало, что границы театра условны, и весь мир может быть сценой. Выступление артистов в живописных и знаковых локациях Кубани публика может увидеть в серии видеороликов и фотографий проекта. В других не менее интересных и новаторских театральных проектов в сети можно узнать на портале Культура Онлайн. Не пропустите лучшие постановки. Подпишитесь на новости сайта.
Новый просветительский проект «Культура онлайн» – это портал о культурных инициативах в интернете. Он знакомит аудиторию с инновационными онлайн-проектами из регионов России и других стран. Российский фонд культуры в сотрудничестве с Санкт-Петербургским международным культурным форумом создал эту площадку для всех, кто интересуется и профессионально занимается культурой и искусством, а также хочет создавать свои проекты в сети. Ведь опыт других авторов и советы специалистов могут помочь и подтолкнуть к воплощению новых креативных идей. Предпосылкой к созданию ресурса послужило вручение премии «Культура онлайн» в 2020 году. На соискание премии были выдвинуты российские цифровые проекты, которые активно создавались в период пандемии. Строгие ограничения изменили традиционный формат работы учреждений культуры. На премию было подано большое количество ярких, насыщенных и оригинальных цифровых проектов. Это привело организаторов к идее собрать их в одном месте и постоянно пополнять коллекцию. На старте портал представляет свыше 230 цифровых культурных проектов. Мобильные приложения, онлайн-спектакли, виртуальные выставки, трансляции концертов, подкасты, блоги о культуре и многое другое. День Победы – это шедевр шедевров, это император этих песен. Вот. И я очень рад, что именно мы это сделали. Я очень доволен результатом и, в общем, горжусь, что это мне пришлось в этом серьезно поучаствовать. И что это получилось. Очень хорошие отзывы. Вся страна объединилась. На самом деле замещение какой-то образовавшейся пустоты. Потому что, как вы знаете, концертные залы закрылись, и, в общем, вдруг остановилась концертная деятельность, театры, филармонии, а люди стремятся к этому. Важность именно в том, что не утонула сама культура, сама музыка. Культура онлайн объединяет уникальный опыт сотен цифровых проектов из самых разных областей культуры. Новые идеи и формы призваны вдохновлять авторов и способствовать цифровизации культуры и развитию креативных индустрий. Информационная поддержка портала поможет уже существующим проектам обрести новую аудиторию.